Life was difficult in Germany in the era of the Weimar Republic between the First and Second World Wars. Harsh reparations from the First World War as well as the Great Depression meant that by 1932 nearly 30 percent of German workers were without a job and many businesses went bankrupt, including a electrical consulting business that was run by a man named Oscar Speck. An adventurous 25-year-old Speck decided that the best solution to the problem was to escape Germany in a kayak, and that would lead him on an epic adventure, the story of which was nearly lost amongst the dramatic events of the era. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Speck, born in 1907, was a young boy during World War I, and in 1932, after losing his business, decided that his love of kayaking could offer him a way out of the country. The Sydney Australia Morning Herald wrote in 1949, he was 25. Canoeing had been his pastime for 10 years. Germany was in the middle of a depression. It seemed a good time to get out for a while. He took some money, a lot of naivete, and his collapsible kayak named Sunshine to the Danube and proceeded to row away without looking back. Stowed aboard with him were an extra paddle, a prismatic compass, charts and documents for navigating, two brass containers with film, cameras and clothing, and five gallon water tanks for drinking water. The 18-foot collapsible kayak was 2 feet 10 inches at the beam, had a freeboard of just over 9 inches, and weighed 65 pounds. He could raise two square feet of sail, could carry around a third of a ton. His goal was to reach Cyprus and seek work in the copper mines there, but after just a few days of partying along the river, he ran out of money. Funding his adventure was its own adventure. He seems to have had a favorite sibling, Greta, who perhaps begrudgingly funded parts of his voyage, in this first case within ten days of his asking. Even so, he ended up working odd jobs or begging at times, especially after deciding that the Danube was too tame and destroying his kayak in some rapids on the Varder River, which had not been explored. He ended up sending the skin back home to be repaired, but by the time it was returned, the river had frozen over. This was merely the first of many delays. Having kayaked only in rivers and lakes, his first foray into open seas was the Aegean. With a rubber and canvas skin over a wooden frame, Speck had to make some adjustments to his 18-foot vessel. It was a two-seater, although he removed the second seat for storage, with a small rudder controlled by foot pedals. He added splash guards to prevent the waves from sinking him. This might be a good point to mention that Oscar Speck didn't know how to swim. He said of himself, by all sane standards, I was mad, and yet he described his trip down the coast of Greece as a kayaker's dream. According to his recollections, Speck made it through the Aegean with a lot of luck. He learned to ride out waves without capsizing and somehow managed to avoid being crushed by an ocean liner. I was able to avoid large waves, twist and turn the boat whichever way I wanted. It turned into acrobatic sailing, and bit by bit I learned how to cope with huge seas. He sailed close to shorelines and hopped from island to island, never daring to fall asleep on the water. And he began to enjoy himself so much that he decided that Cyprus was no longer the goal. His seafaring adventures were more alluring than copper mines. In the Australasian Post magazine, he shared his thoughts. My kayak proved to have qualities which even the maker never claimed for it. It won me friendships right across the world. It was a first-class ticket to everywhere. A little restricted why one was actually traveling, more than a little perilous, but it brought me privileges which your passenger in an ocean liner's deluxe suite can never know. Upon reaching the island of Andros, he was greeted by two young ladies in white dresses. It was Easter, and he stated, Andros is a wealthy island, and I was taken to a dance at the shipowners club, where lovely girls who spoke English better than I did danced with me. There you have the contrast which the kayak can offer to her master. At one hour you can be fighting against a head sea, you are in real peril. In the next hour, you're sitting in one of the windows of a magnificent club. There's music and girls and the wines of the world to choose from. And so his adventure became more adventurous, and he started to think of making Australia, far away in the southern hemisphere, his end goal. Speck's crossing from Turkey to Cyprus was his first long open sea stretch, 45 miles. After 24 hours of paddling, he washed up on a shore and collapsed in exhaustion, his hands painful after clutching the paddle for so long. He ran into difficulty at the Suez Canal. In an interview, he claims that the Suez was too well-traveled for such an adventure as himself, but other reports say he was simply denied passage. Either way, he ended up taking his kayak on what he describes as a wreck of a bus through the desert to the Euphrates River. In the Middle East, his adventures were more dangerous. Twice he was shot at. Once his kayak and all his belongings were stolen. Two Westerners following in his stead were killed for refusing hospitality, something Speck had never considered doing. 
Poverty and corruption in the villages he passed through required quick thinking in order to continue safely on his way. Huge stretches of the river had very little food or water. His kayak finally wore out at the mouth of the Persian Gulf, and during the wait for its replacement, he contracted malaria. This delayed him by six months. But along the Indian coast, circumstances changed. Word of his voyage had spread ahead of him, and he became a bit of a celebrity. The London Sunday Telegraph wrote in 2002 that in his white pith helmet and khaki shorts, Mr. Speck then skirted the west coast of India. He financed his trip by giving lectures along the way, including one to a troop of Boy Scouts in Madras. His kayak would often be surrounded by onlookers, and his welcomes became more extravagant. Upon arrival in Baluchistan, which is now a border province of Pakistan, he was greeted by Sir Norman Carter, the top British official. Carter was to have been enjoying a hunting party with the Khan of Kalat, but instead of shooting with the Maharajas, he invited Speck to have drinks with him. He was invited into the realm of British colonial rulers and enjoyed every minute. Regular donations and pledges for his journey eased his financial woes. The Indian Ocean, however, was less agreeable. Eight of ten times he capsized during the trip occurred off the coast of India, one in which he lost everything. He survived a 35-foot tall tidal swell and so decided to try calmer inland waterways, but his celebrity status attracted such huge crowds that he was forced to stay out at sea. At one port, he was detained for two days as a possible German spy. Speck reached Colombo in Sri Lanka three years after he began his voyage. He described it as tame and lacking as compared to Bombay, where he enjoyed dancing. From there, monsoon season and health issues from his malaria slowed him down substantially. Throughout all of his trip, he kept in touch with family and friends by mail. Amazingly, mail service was fairly quick. Speck kept these letters, hoping to write a book. Many are now in a collection at the Australian National Maritime Museum. In 1936, Speck made his way past Calcutta, through the Bay of Bengal and Burma, to the Dutch East Indies. In Singapore, he transferred his belongings to a new kayak and headed into the string of islands with their dangerous currents and tidal flows. Having been gone five years, Germany was not the same country he had left. Hitler had begun rebuilding the German army and opening concentration camps. Speck was certain he would reach Australia late in 1937, and he told his friends and family to have mail sent to Thursday Island. His next major stop was Batavia, now known by its older name, Jakarta. He was well received by the Germans there and was even able to buy a film camera. Shortly thereafter, he spent six months recovering from a bout of malaria, and his luck began to run out with the natives. At one stop, he had stones thrown at him, and another a group of men attacked him in the middle of the night. They beat and kicked him and bound him with strips of buffalo hide and ransacked his kayak. He was hit in the left ear, and it burst his eardrum. At some point, they left him alone, and he was able to loosen the ties and escape back to his kayak. He was able to report the attack to local authorities, and six of his sackers were arrested, but the damage to his eardrum required surgery, and he had to backtrack nearly 1,600 miles to the nearest hospital, delaying the trip by nearly a year. Some political disagreement further lengthened his trip when he was denied passage via the southern coast of New Guinea, but rather had to take the northern route around it, adding an additional 2,500 miles of mostly uncharted territory along the Pacific Ocean. Natives in the area were known to have practiced cannibalism, but the photos Speck took of this time are an amazing legacy. He documented tribal dances and distant cultures so far removed from the Western world. The Sunday Telegraph notes one of the most peculiar events. On New Britain, off the east coast of New Guinea, the exhausted German became the subject of cult worship, hailed and fated by the locals as a god. He finally reached Saibai Island in the far north of Australia in September of 1939, more than seven years after his departure, having covered some 30,000 miles in five boats. Given his celebrity, he might have expected a warm welcome, but the world situation had changed. Germany had invaded Poland, and Australia had entered the war on September 3rd. The Herald wrote in 1949, Hitler was almost unknown when he left Germany, but Hitler's war stopped him when he was 18 miles from Thursday Island. Upon his arrival, Speck was congratulated by three Australian policemen, who promptly declared him a prisoner of war and sent him to an internment camp. In 2001, the Herald explained he finished the journey to mainland Australia not in his trusty flat boot, but in an official launch as an enemy alien. He spent nearly seven years in the internment camp, ironically nearly the same length as his kayak journey. He was released in January 1946, but chose to remain in Australia. The Herald noted, he got here the hard way and he intends to stay. He went to Lightning Ridge in New South Wales, a center for mining opals, where he learned the opal cutting trade. He became a successful businessman, writing later to his sister that he had become quite skinny, not for lack of food, as he was rather wealthy, but because there was so much work to be done. 
He always did the first cuts on his opals so as to not have them ruined by inexperienced cutters. He had to respond to requests for speeches and appearances. He was having a boat built, and that needed to be supervised, along with his property outside of town. His BMW had to be maintained, and as it was German, he was the best person to handle that, along with, of course, keeping the car clean because it had to be parked on a road. As much as he seemed to enjoy his life down under, he had to admit it came by surprise. In an interview, he said, I had no idea in 1932 that I would end up in Australia. Speck hoped to publish a book on his adventures, but he could never find a publisher. It was just overshadowed by all the events of the war, although it was eventually serialized in the Australasian Post in 1956. And the Herald notes he would occasionally tell his story to Rotary Clubs. He wrote to his sister, I had reached my goal, but not one of the numerous doubters would ever find out, and my modest success in reaching Australia in my folding boat would be swallowed up in the imminent huge global catastrophe. But he seemed not to be bitter. In his final letter to his sister Greta, he said, I am satisfied, recognition or no recognition. We have a strange situation. One of the most difficult world records to this day, and it still be in a hundred years, and wholly unknown. But I am satisfied. The war interfered much more with millions of fates. Why shouldn't I be satisfied? Oscar Speck died in Australia in 1993 at the age of 88. His partner, Nancy Jean Steele, bequeathed a collection of his materials to the Australian National Maritime Museum, which has brought new attention to his story and which was kind enough to provide photographs for this episode. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.